Coach, how you doing? I'm doing all right. Just got in out of the vineyard. Well, I, you know, we talked the other day and I was like, Coach, we'd love to have you on. And you go, well, I'm going to be out, you know, picking grapes. And I don't, for some reason, I thought maybe that was metaphorical or something, but you're, you're literally out there. Oh, yeah. In Napa Valley. I just got in. How's it going out there? It's all a little too hot, a little too hot. And uh, we have concern what it'll do to the overall quality and the, and the quantity uh, of the grapes. But uh, right now we're surviving. Are you looking at cooler days ahead to help you out there? Or is it going to stay yeah, hot? It's cooler today. See, it was cooler today. It's supposed to be hot again tomorrow, but it was 114 here. So yeah, yesterday. <sighs> wow. We, we got kind of a break here in the Midwest. You know how the Kansas city could be. We're like living in the eighties here. So yeah, I, yeah, I was in nice. LA last week. It was pretty nice. So this, you know, that's, that's the weather for you. Vermeil wines, everything else going well. What, uh, What's what's new with Vermeil Wines right now? What we can what can we send people to right now? Well, you know we're going to have a Hall of Fame label wine. Uh, uh, we're going to make about a hundred cases. Very expensive. The grapes are coming from Beckstoffer Vineyard, which is the elite vineyard in the Napa Valley. It's all very expensive. It's expensive to buy the grapes. <laughs> it's expensive to produce the bottle, and the person that buys it, it's going to cost money. <laughs> but anyway, it's going to be a limited edition, and I'm excited about it. I had a meeting with Andy Beckstoffer last week, the owner of the vineyard, who really is the number one vineyard in the Napa Valley. And uh, we're excited about the project and anxious to see how it'll go. Yeah, absolutely. You want to make sure everybody goes to vermeilwines.com and you can join the wine club. We, I got some still. I have, I, had to open, I think, the Chardonnay. I had to open. I kept a couple bottles that uh, Carl Peterson sent us. I kept a couple. So I'm going to let those marinate for a while, Coach, before I bust those open. I'm going to wait till the next Chief Super Bowl to open those, which hopefully will be this year, right? Yeah, you hope so. I hope so. Yeah, I'm pulling for them, you bet. Well, we had Trent Green on a couple days before the Hall of Fame, Coach. He talked about uh, just how much you meant to him. The Hall of Fame is now official. It happened in August there in Canton. Uh, between Trent Green and us, we said we said the over under for coach's speech would be about seven or eight minutes. We all took the over and we all hit big winners for all of us. It was great to see you enshrined there with the gold jacket. You're in elite company, Hall of Famer, Coach Dick Vermeil. This is just uh, this is just tremendous. And what was your feelings like during the event? I know Andy Reid came up during training camp to see you. A lot of good things came from that that weekend. Yeah, no, we have no question. You know, we, we were all limited to an eight minute presentation. The speech had to be handed in in time to, you know, a number of days prior to the event. And prior to me going on, uh, Jim Porter, the, the president of the Hall of Fame, came to me and said, you know, you're last to go ahead and do what you want. So it relieved me from the eight minute uh, routine that you had to rehearse and be prepared to give and, and uh, allowed me to just go ahead and speak from the heart and really do a better job of thanking those people that were deeply responsible for me being there. And that really relaxed me and helped me. Now, I don't know if he was telling me to go 22 minutes like I did, <laughs> but I was, I really appreciate the opportunity to try to do a better job. <clears throat> yeah. What did it mean to you, not only for Andy Reid to come up, but just uh, seeing all the former players come out and support you and kind of show what you meant to them and just how excited they were for you just living that moment as a hall of famer. Well, you know, I've always believed that uh, it's the players. It's the critical element in regard to winning as and, and being considered a fine football coach. I was always a better football coach when I had great players playing for me. For example, you know, our offensive line and that at the Chiefs, Casey Wigman in the center, and, you know, you look at all, uh, Hall of Fame right guard, you know, Hall of Fame tight end, and Tony Gonzalez, Will Shields, Hall of Fame left tackle, and Willie Rowe, you know, and Priest Holm. And then, you know, and we didn't have the had as much uh, outstanding as many outstanding players on defense was probably the reason we never got to the hall of fame or else we didn't do a good enough job coaching one or the other, but to, uh, uh, to all of a sudden end up in the hall of fame, it makes you realize how uh, many people contributed, how many people were really critical. And there were, and you start thinking about the critical things that happened within your career that allowed you to put the gold jacket on. For example, Ricky Prohl, we're playing an NFC championship game uh, at, at late in the fourth quarter. He catches a pass that a lot of receivers would not catch that we win the game. Okay. Yeah. So that propels us to the Super Bowl. 
All right, we get to the Super Bowl. Isaac Bruce and Kurt Warner team up for a bomb that wins the game for us. Mike Jones makes a tackle on the last play of the game. Those guys don't do that. Well, I'm not standing there wearing the gold jacket. So, and that's how I've always related any success that I've had as a coach. It goes back to my players and the coaches that helped me prepare them to play. Yeah, no, no. Feel real good about that. And I, what I felt good about there, and you mentioned how many were there, was that they all really enjoyed the experience of being there. We had over 400 people at our party. In fact, my Ram team, we had the entire offensive team intact. Every wow. position starter was there, including the fall four Hall of Famers and some of the backups. So, and, and, uh, and now Will Shields couldn't be there because he had the COVID that time when we had other people that had issues that couldn't be there. But there was a large group going all the way back to the six kids from Hillsdale High School Championship team in 1961. Wow. So, you can imagine how rewarding it is to be able to share that experience because they helped create it. And you had three fan bases sharing that experience. You had Eagles fans, Chiefs fans, Rams fans. I mean, it was just a wonderful experience for all involved. And uh, we, we were just so, you know, it was such an honor for us to, to, to be on hand and to, uh, we talked uh, to Trent Green beforehand and it was just, yeah. The, he, he yeah. was just he the the feelings and the emotions he had and now to see where he is as a broadcaster climbing that ladder on CBS Trent Green um it gets no better than a guy like him and I remember there was that uh was that during the 03 season did uh did, did Carol give you a car or something during a practice and I just remember Trent Green's reaction to that was there a car oh, yeah that was it that was in 2003 yeah yeah yeah, yeah. but uh there were there were so many things to be really thankful for and feel very special about yeah but really the fact that andy reed showed up there with tammy the wow. night before the, the the night of the gold jacket and left the practice field came there then went back to practice the next day i think that's the finest uh, tribute of respect i've ever had paid by another football coach to me in my career and i will always be grateful for the, being able to experience that uh that overall feeling that it gave me to see Andy Reid standing there. It, it'll always be a positive thing in, with me. Yeah. And speaking of Andy Reid, I mean, we're moving on into the season. It's coming up on us. It kind of snuck up on us here, but uh, the chiefs go to Arizona. They take on the Cardinals. I mean, a lot of people are kind of writing off this chiefs team. They want to bury them. They want to anoint someone else right now. It's the chargers and Justin Herbert. They're going to take the AFC West, but we've got all sorts of new coaches in this division. I mean, Brandon Staley was already here with the chargers, but in comes Nathaniel Hackett with the Broncos, Josh McDaniels with the Raiders and people want to write off Andy Reid and Patrick Mahomes. What is going on? Well, I think they're making a mistake. That's what's going on. <laughs> you know, and, uh, we all don't know. All, everybody has an opinion prior to the season and there's always people that end up being as good as they were or better. And there's always a few that aren't as good as they were. But I, th I think Andy's team will be no less than it was and maybe a little better. You know, they had some issues. and uh, But uh, I, just, I just can't see Andy's team uh, really big drastically uh, in a negative direction. I just can't ever see that happen. He, he has so many great years of experience doing things right, making mistakes, correcting them, doing those things, personnel decisions, all these kinds of things. They have that whole organization from Clark Hunt uh, down running, uh, you know, like a 12 cylinder uh, Ferrari, you know, yeah. it's very smooth and they all know what they're doing. And I just can't see them not being really competitive. And yeah, the advantage he has, over people starting out as their head coach, you know, a new one and with the Raiders, I want to say Oakland and, and San Diego. I want to say San Diego. Yep. The Chargers, okay, I can't help myself. Uh, they have a long ways to go to catch up. There's no substitute for wisdom and you can't, you can hire people with wisdom, which we all try to do, but the wisdom of the Kansas city chiefs all starts with the head coach and Andy Reid. It, it, it's a hell of a job to catch up with him. I'll tell you that. Well, as an offensive coach, just kind of talk about uh, Andy Reid and these new pieces. You lose a Tyree kill, kind of an irreplaceable player coach. I mean, he, you know, as electrifying downfield as anyone we've seen, but you know, more, maybe more deep at the receiving position, adding Juju Smith Schuster, adding Marquez Valdez Scantling. You draft a guy like Sky Moore. Do you feel like Andy Reid uh, is going to be able to sort of use, you know, this, the depth and these players kind of differently 
than, than we use Tyreek Hill. And would, would we expect a drop off at all from this offense after losing uh, a Tyreek Hill? Well, you're always going to miss a Tyreek Hill. But what Andy will do, in my opinion, is he'll spread the big plays over more people. And there won't be one dominating big playmaker. You'd love to have yeah. him. Yes, that's not the National Football League anymore. You can't. It's hard to keep all those guys. But uh, I, I think you'll find that the big plays will be spread over more offensive players, starting with your tight end. You know, he isn't too shabby. It's true. <laughs> but uh, I think that'll happen. And I think, you know, that uh, Spagnuolo will keep improving that defense. You know, as long as they can rush the passer, they got the big defensive tackle inside and he's maturing and playing more consistently well on every snap. These kinds of things are, are going to maybe make up for the one great player that you lost. Yeah, and going back to the coaching aspect, I mean, just a few minutes here ago, the Chiefs are kind of doing their their press conferences on a Wednesday, and Patrick Mahomes was asked, does Cliff Kingsbury know how to stop you, your former college coach? And Patrick's response was, gee, I hope not. And so <laughs> my question to you is, all those years ago at Texas Tech, Patrick Mahomes has just developed so much and become just such a better, more well-rounded quarterback. Does Cliff Kingsbury just know any tricks of the trade that could stop a Patrick Mahomes? No. <laughs> no, no one's that bright, okay? <laughs> uh, he might have some dominating players in specific positions that could create problems for Patrick Mahomes, but it won't be because of a coach is having uh, experience working with him or anything like that. Uh, I think all coaches now, especially true in the National Football League, like, coach against somebody they've coached before. It's a free agency and moving around and all that guy. Hey, you know, what you have, a 20%, 25% change in roster every year, that never used to be that way. But so I don't think uh, you might, it might be an advantage if you had a, an offensive tackle and you knew his weaknesses and you could prepare your defensive guy on the one-on-one -on -one battles. This is what he has trouble doing. We want to make sure we put him in a position to create, uh, take advantage of those uh, things they know about him. But the quarterback himself, I, I just, I can't believe anyone uh, having enough experience being around him that can make a difference in how he plays. Week one can be so, you know, it, it could be so all over the place. It could, it could be so unpredictable. We, we talked last year with you. We had Dwayne Rudd on the show with you talking about the week one Cleveland helmet throw, the craziness of that game. Just do you think the chiefs kind of have an advantage here because, you know, Patrick Mahomes and the starting offense played uh, several series during the preseason when a lot of coaches are shutting people down for the preseason. This is all very new. We all hear stories about your training camps, coach, that maybe we're a little on the heavy handed side. The Chiefs are coming through here week one, lots of uncertainty. So you got to bring your A game, right? I mean, this is uh, week one. A lot of things can happen. We A lot of unknowns out there. So week one, there's it's a wild card, is it not? Yeah. Well, I tell you, Andy Reid is what he is, a future Hall of Fame coach, because what he's done and knows what he's doing. Don Shula's in the Hall of Fame because he knew what he was doing. Bill Parcells in the Hall of Fame. Tom, oh yeah, Tom, they all knew what they were doing. And they all prepared their quarterbacks by giving them opportunities to get better during the preseason. You know, the great golfers don't take three weeks off before they play the next tournament. You know, the great tennis players, the best in the world, practice, practice, practice in intense situations. And I really believe it's just me. I'm old fashioned that when you don't play your quarterbacks some with your complete units within the preseason games, uh, you're you're not going to be what you ought to be in the opener. That's my opinion. I could be proven wrong. Yeah. And just, I wanted to ask just kind of how the chiefs are going to implement all these new faces, all these young guys We're heading into week one. This is kind of new for them. We had a little dry run in preseason, but we've mentioned the receivers, Isaiah Pacheco, they're going to want to see in action, uh, the running back out of Rutgers. They took in the seventh round, really impressed in the preseason. And then on the defense, George Karloftis, Leo Chanel, uh, Joshua Williams and Justin Reed. I mean, they've just got all these new faces, especially on the defensive side and in that receiver core. Just how is Andy Reed going to try and fit and get these guys up to speed for week one? They got to be ready to go. Well, you know, the expression you use, this isn't his first rodeo. <laughs> <laughs> he, he knows what he's doing. He's done it so many times now, and he's done it right so many times that uh, I don't think all the new faces, uh, uh, will be a detriment. I think it'll end up being a positive move. And of course, you're still, you're going to miss that bomber. Okay. You're going to miss Tyreek. You know, we would all miss him, but I, I think they'll be, they'll supplement other talents in there to exploit defenses 
that'll uh, I think negate the loss if they're if if possible. Yeah, Coach, I know you know back when you come to Kansas City, the AFCs got some great quarterbacks. Yeah, uh, Ben Roethlisberger's just starting out. No four, Philip Rivers. Gets drafted no four, but you got Tom Brady established, Peyton Manning established at that time. But have you, aside from that, I mean, do you ever remember a time when the AFC, the NFL in general, just has so many capable quarterbacks? You see Josh Allen, an MVP candidate out there in Buffalo. We, you know, in the Chiefs division, Justin Herbert, Russell Wilson's come over. Derek Carr is pretty good, you know, when given the opportunity. Have you ever remember a time when the AFC was just this loaded at the quarterback position? I don't. I don't remember that. I really don't. And I, I haven't. I don't remember seeing so many good young ones right. all at the same time. Now you can go back to Marino and all these kind of guys when they came in, but God, it's hard to duplicate the quality of the young quarterbacks today uh, it, by thinking back and studying the old rosters and saying, well, these guys are close or these guys aren't close, but that group, uh, you, you, you mentioned them just outstanding. And, 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 you know, it's easier for them to look outstanding today because all the rules have been moved right. to the pass offense and, and the court and the wide receivers and all these kind of things. So, and then, and the, the coaching of the game uh, as it is today exploits the talent of the quarterback more so today, you know, you aren't running the ball 42, 45 times a game anymore. Right. You know? So yeah, you're giving the quarterbacks more opportunities to demonstrate what they can do. Of course, if they're not good enough, they demonstrate they can't play, you know? <laughs> yeah. But Coach, I mean, the Chiefs have two games here in five days. We've got the Cardinals on Sunday, then the Chargers on Thursday. I mean, just kind of take us through how a coach and a team prepare in such a short time period, a quick turnaround like that. Well, you know, I think if, since it's one and two, the first two games, a lot of preparation was done in through the preseason preparation and practices with knowledge of what we're, you know, going to be emphasizing through these two games, you know, the offensive and defensive coaching staffs today are so much bigger than they used to be. You can have people working in advance today where you didn't have that opportunity in the old days. So uh, I think, uh, I think uh, if anyone would have a team ready to play in the, at the first two games of the season in a short period of time, uh, it would be Andy Reid because, you know, I guarantee you, it isn't probably the first time it's happened to it, you know, mm -hmm. But how many years now? 21 years? Am I right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you aren't, aren't going to surprise him with many new uh, routines. Yeah. Yeah, he's going to be uh, definitely bound for Canton as well. And I kind of wanted to ask you, is this game is such an emotional game for so many people. You've always been an emotional person. So going back to your weekend in Canton, was there, was there a moment or a, a player or maybe someone that surprised you? Maybe it was Andy Reid showing up or another moment that stands out that that really tested your emotions as it were. We talked with Trent Green about this and he said, we're going to have to keep the Kleenex near coach. Cause it's going to be, it's going to be an emotional weekend for him. So is there something that stands out? Well, first off the Andy Reid situation, right. Which I talked about, that was probably the most startling positive, uh, few moments that I experienced in all of fame. Okay. And then, uh, the next day in the actual event, looking down and seeing my whole family sitting there in the front row, the only two Vermeil family that weren't there were the two great granddaughters and their mothers. Okay. So uh, that, that was a very uh, touching experience just to look down there and see them and know why they're there. You know, I, I never pictured myself standing up there on that stage. I just never put myself in, in that category. And all of a sudden it's a re it's real. Hey, this has really happened. I look out there, you keep mentioning Trent Green, why not? You know, he, he touched my career as much as any football player I ever coached. That's why I wanted him standing on the stage when I they put my gold jacket on when Carol did it. So, and Ron Jaworski, you know, and Ron Jaworski was, was in tears when they were putting, Carol was putting my jacket. I look over and he's, he's got tears in his eyes. So, and then you know, Kurt Warner was there. So that was special. The next day, John Shire was there uh, from my UCLA quarterback when I unveiled the, the bust, you know. Those kinds of things uh, really mean a lot to me, mean a lot to me. And I look out there and I see my oldest living friend, 92 years old, comes in from Fresno, California, still farming his vineyards in Fresno. Uh, he's sitting there, you know, wow. and then you look and, uh, yeah, and then, uh, you know, the granddaughter of the owner of the Philadelphia Eagles is sitting there, you know, and it makes you think about all these people, you know, 
of Lamar Hunt's family's era. How could you not think positively about Lamar Hunt? Exactly. So uh, there were wow. so many things that really uh, touched me like that. It's a, uh, it's hard to narrow it down to one or two specific things. Yeah, Coach, we're just so excited for you to finally be a Hall of Famer, so well-deserved, and we're so Thank glad you. that the weekend was just so wonderful and overwhelming for you. That's the way it should be. And just kind of the last thing before we let you go here, uh, being here in Kansas City, we've talked about, we know Andy Reid's going to make the Hall of Fame one day whenever he hangs it up. Hopefully, I'm going to save him a seat enough. next to me, okay? There yeah. you go. <laughs> <laughs> but... Being here in Kansas City, we got to ask, I mean, you mentioned how like some of those players helped you get to the Hall of Fame. I mean, if Mike Question. Jones doesn't make that tackle, maybe you're not in. Yeah. So we got to ask about Marty Schottenheimer. No question. You, think you, talk, you mentioned the word deserve. It, I mean, no question he deserves to be in there. Yeah. But, uh, Dan Reeves, they deserve to be in there. And, you know, they've only put 10 coaches in in the last 25 years. Okay, I was the 11th one to go in in 26 seasons. It's hard. The way they're doing it now, I really believe there'll be a coach go in every year and we Good. will get caught up. We will get caught up. My personal feeling is I mentioned it at the end of my presentation. I'll feel better when Marty Schottenheimer goes in, when Dan Reeves goes in, you know, when Tom Coughlin goes in, these guys, uh, Mike Holmgren, uh, you know, oh, I can't think of them all right now. You know, Shanahan. Uh, I, I would like to see are the great coaches that deserve to be in there that are have passed on go in with the new the, a coach to go in together sure with the coach that's alive that's do, you lose you use the term deserve no question they deserve so if they put in Mike Shanahan put in Marty Schottenheimer in with him at the same time yes. why not sometimes they put in two offensive players in, or they put two defensive players in, why not two coaches in and catch up a little bit with the guys that really, really deserve to be there. Yeah. Marty, you know Marty deserves to be in there. We know Marty deserves Question. to be in there, but does the, does the committee, he didn't win a Super Bowl. Are they going to hold that against him? No. Well, they just nominated Don Coriel and he's Don Coriel never got close though. He deserves it. Okay. Yeah. But he's passed on. Why not put on, put in with him another living coach that, uh, also really deserve it. I'm happy for Don Coriel. I know him very well. Yeah. Excellent coach. Well, we can't be, you know, more excited for you and thank you for literally you're in, coming off the vineyard there picking grapes for one the wonderful Vermeil wines brand, which is outstanding. And we can't, you know, wish people enough to go, to go check it out. And especially those here, our listeners here in Kansas city guys, they ship it right out to you. I've got some that I'm going to open for when the Chiefs win Super Bowl, uh, you know, 57 here, ready to do it. Coach, thank you so much. Have a great rest of the weekend. Hope it cools off for you a little bit out there. Yeah, I mean, me come too. on. It's cooler today. It was 82 out there this morning. Right now at that, at 82, they say it's going to be back up in tri triple digits tomorrow. So oh. thank you for the opportunity to say hello to Kansas City. Absolutely. Thank Always. you so much, Anytime, Coach. Coach. Take care. You too. It's an honor.